We got a deal, you fucking animal! Oh, dude, did you fuck this bread? You fuck the shit out of this bread? You don't fuck bread, God? I had me a And welcome to my future husband's face fuck episode 20. <gasps> if you listened to us last time, Sarah and I had this, some sort of discussion about what the 20th episode would be. Sarah really wanted to do talk about all the James Bond movies, we but uh, but we've been slacking. We slacked on the James Bond movies, and not because we because I've actually been like really wanting to watch them, <laughs> but there's been other things that like kind of were trumping it, and then going to see kind of newer movies and stuff. Yeah, and you know. I'm at work a lot, so... <laughs> and I won't watch them without her, so... Like, that's... our That's the deal. Like, I wait for Sarah, so I can't just watch them when she's not around. You're so nice. Haphazardly watching James Bond movies like some sort of that. selfish wasp. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, but yeah, actually, you know what's really funny? Like, if we briefly talk about this a little bit. What? We were watching, there's a thing called the uh, Awesome Games Done Quick 2014. Yeah. These people doing speed runs of video games, and uh, they were doing for like seven days straight. Actually, tonight's the last night, so you missed it, sorry. Yes, we could have. The 4th through the 11th, and they were raising money for a charity, and they raised a shit ton of money, but they were doing 24 hours a day for seven days, like people streaming. That would suck if you got the speed run at like an awkward time, like three <laughs> in the morning. Some of them were, but some of them were like the games that you were interested, people would be interested in watching. It was weird, because the most popular stuff is at peak hours. Like, the yeah. peak, like, usually around like 8, or something like that. Yeah. They did, like, the Zelda, they started doing Zelda games, like, 8 o'clock. Right. You know, do stuff like that. Uh, but last, this morning, there was, like, Goldeneye and stuff. Oh, that's pretty sweet. Yeah, that would have been interesting to watch. And then late last night, they did Super Metroid, which was, like, a big, that's a big one. That is a big one. And that was probably the most exciting one. There was four people, and they were all the ones that were, like... One of them were, was the world record holder. The other three were behind him within, like, seconds of, like, his record. Oh, that'd be so frustrating. So, the, and they were all competing. And it was it was actually... Does, it was he, interesting. does he still hold the world record? Yeah, he does. He didn't beat his record, either. Okay. Um, but the thing that about, like, the speedrunnings, I, I find, like, the, the older games are way more entertaining to watch people speedrun, because it's based on, like, skill more, and, and knowledge of the game more than, like, exploiting, like, bugs is... in, in buggy, like, era of games. Yeah. Like, the Nintendo 64 ones, I, I find, are pretty boring. No, they are. Um, because it's like... just people, like, clipping into walls, and then, I think there's interesting stuff that they learn. They learn about the mechanics of the game and how things work, and, like, in, in terms of, like, animations, like, character animations yeah. and stuff, and how to... Like, in Zelda, the, the guy would, like, have a bomb. Majora's Mask. And then he would be able to, like, blow himself through walls by, like, exploiting the fact that the game can't render the explosion in the wall at the same time. Yeah, I, I was really sad, because that's my favorite Zelda game, and it was just kind of, like, oh, yeah, kind of kid, boring to kid, watch. Yeah, the kid who played it was a little unengaging, I guess would be the right way to say yeah. it. Yeah. The greasy, greasy nerd kid. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it's actually, but overall, it was, it was, uh, I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed it, but it, it did suck up a lot of, like, our, like, watching time. Yes. I was watching that rather than watching James Bond, because it was a live stream, so I was like, oh, okay, you know. In real life. <laughs> can't, can't miss it, you know? Yeah. It doesn't cater to my personal schedule. So, I don't know, it was interesting, though. Just as yeah, a, I liked a it. small aside, I guess, but, like, it's something I've never, ever even got into at all. No, I would never be able to do speed runs. No, I mean even watching it. Oh, really? Or knowing, it. I mean, I know, I knew that people did it, but I never watched them. Like, I never watched speed I runs. I watched a couple. Have you really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I might have saw a super Super Metroid one before. Seems like that's the most competitive and popular one is Super Metroid. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Even even when they did the Super Metroid one, which I've was seen the... which was unique to all the other ones, they actually had actual commentators. Yeah. Like, so it well, sounded like... that's the like one a, that when I was falling asleep last night, Yeah, right? so it sounded like a proper, like, sports Event. broadcast. Yeah, like it did. Like, e-sports broadcast. Uh, but it was, it was interesting, and if you're into, like, nerdy stuff, it's totally, 
totally worth checking out. And it's for a good cause. So. It's for a good cause, and if you go look up, you'll probably be able to watch all the restreams and people posting stuff on YouTube and whatnot. Mm -hmm. segments of the game. So, it's, it's worth checking out. It's interesting. Uh, and the thing that's interesting about it is most of the players actually walk you through what they're doing. And so, the enjoyment kind of comes based on, like, who's playing the game and how engaging they are. No, I agree. That makes for a much better watching experience. Because I don't know if I could just watch it without any commentating. That would be, probably get kind of boring. Oh, I would be done. <laughs> yeah. So, it was, it's interesting. It's interesting worth checking out. Awesome date games done quick. 2014. Thank you for entertaining me Fuck this week. Fuck you, cancer. Fuck cancer, man. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, I don't know. I mean, the only thing of significance we've watched, uh, as far as television-wise, is uh, The Poor Man's Kitchen Nightmares. Yes. Bar Rescue. From Spike TV's Bar Rescue. And it is oozing Spike TV-ness. Oh, it is. It is. It is. Um, what would <laughs> what? you think of it? I enjoyed it, actually. John Taffer? Yeah, John Taffer. Come on, man. How could you not enjoy the Taffer? Um, it did get kind of grating, because we, you know, marathoned it as we normally marathon things. Yeah, because I just stumbled upon it, and then, well, I'd heard about it, and then I stumbled, and then I started watching it one, like, afternoon, and I just watched that all, and I woke until, up, like, we it went was to sleep. Yeah. No, we watched the whole thing in a day. Well, all the episodes that were available on Hulu Plus, yeah. it was like half of the season. So, But it was still like 12 episodes. I think it's an interesting concept, though, because, I mean, it does bring up a good point that, like, there are so many bars, and it's such, like, a failing, like, it's really easy to flop in that business. Well, it's the same, it's exactly the same as Kitchen Nightmares. I know. Except not as well done, and John Taffer is more funny than engaging, like, on, you know, and he's not purposely being funny. No, no, it's not purpose. It's just his reactions to things are. I just want to make that clarification. Hysterical. Yeah, when he freak, I love when he yells and his eyes are bulging out of his face and his like neck veins are bulging. He's oh, yeah. just like, "You fucking idiot!" <laughs> but like, this one is a little bit even more transparently like because even like the say like Kitchen Nightmares with Gordon Ramsay, like a show we both enjoy. Yes. It's hard to say that anything that they do while they're there is going to matter like to 90% of the places they go to yeah a lot of times it's too far gone I mean by the time that these bars and restaurants go through the vetting process of like okay the show chooses this place to to do it like how much time has gone by and how long have they been in financial trouble you know well, what I mean well some of them like, are like the one club was like 2 million in debt yeah yeah the one in are, the gay yeah. club in Vegas yeah yeah. That was the best episode. That was a pretty funny episode. It's so funny, in fact, I feel like having a hard time believing it's maybe it was it's not real. Yeah, it was, though. <laughs> because that guy would call everyone bitches. That's what I mean, though. Is he, like, an actor? Like, I don't know. No. the uh, What I'm referring to is the owner of this. It's the first gay nightclub to open up in Las Vegas. He just freaks out about his bar. He wants his bartenders to play Janet Jackson all the time on the jukebox, and he calls everyone bitches and throws glasses. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah, it's very like stereotypical gay bar like type atmosphere, or at least they try. They want that, anyways. Um, and he's so disappointed with the renovation because it's like just like Kitchen Nightmares. Every episode at the end, there's a full renovation of the bar and kind of a re relaunching of it, like, in the idea that it's a new place now, as trying to change the identity of the place, I suppose, would be a way to... Yeah, it's it. trying to say, because, like, what he says a lot of times, like, you know, because there was one time they didn't change the name, and it was because it was the thing at Rockaway Beach, the bar at Rockaway Beach in New York, because it was such an establishment of the community. Well, the only reason that bar needed rescuing was because of Hurricane King Sandy. Sandy. No, I know, but I'm just saying, but, like, yeah, what he what they do is they change the name and everything about it to kind of say, like, hey, like, if I left it with this name, do you think people will come back even if I painted it and redid it? No. Yeah, because it has a bad reputation. reputation. Yeah. So, uh, but with that one, the guy was so upset that he about the renovations. Yeah, he made it, they not... made it, like, a cool, like, night Havana nightclub, though. Yeah, and he hated it, so he just left, and then... The capper at the end of the episode, they usually be like, you know, six, three weeks later, like, blah, blah, blah happened, or he uh, closed the restaurant two days after the filming, apparently. Yeah. So, or the restaurant, the club, rather. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I don't know, but it's so, it's, I don't know. That one is a little bit more transparent, transparently, like, gross. 
in a weird way. All the I feel like that one's a little more exploitative. All the but so is Kitchen Nightmares. They just the presentation is just better. I don't like about what I didn't like about Bar Rescue is all the like alcohol sponsors that were constantly being thrown at you. Yeah, they all do that though. I mean, all Kitchen of them do Nightmares that. doesn't. He doesn't have... No, oh, I mean, if they put in new kitchen wear and stuff, they usually... They'll need, like, Kitchen Aid or whatever the brand is that they use. But it's not like, here's your new Jose Cuervo, like, yeah. <laughs> cocktail of the day. <laughs> and you're like, what? Don Juan Tequila. Oh, yeah, it's Don Juan Tequila. It's not Jose Cuervo. Jose yeah. Cuervo's the cheap stuff. Yeah, and Captain Morgan, an absolute vodka. And Bullet Bourbon. And Bullet Bourbon. Which makes me sad, because that's my favorite bourbon. Well, hey, you gotta, you know... Sell out. Get sponsors somehow. I guess, you know. Yeah, no, I understand. But that was that would just get annoying. That one is just more like gross reality show. Because I think like it's <laughs> they, it's fair juxtaposition between that and Kitchen Nightmares because it is directly like yeah. the same Dude, concept. My favorite part too was like the mixologists because I have mixologists and bartenders coming to teach the bartenders, you know, how to make new drinks, how to be good bartenders. Is that angry mixologist, that guy? What was his name? The wizard? Yeah, the wizard. We yeah, call him the wizard because he blows fire in his this, little intro. There's this young... He's, he's fairly young. He's probably, like, in his early 30s, and he's, like, you know, one bartender of the world or whatever. Yeah. The best bartender in the country, competitions and shit. And he's pretty aggressive. And he spits fire in his thing. Well, because there's, like, a fundamental flaw, I think, in those shows is that, like, whether it's the kind of drinks they're being asked to make or even Gordon Ramsay coming in and, and making a, a menu... Like, they have, like, 24 hours to learn all this new shit and then try to execute. It's, like, it's set up for failure. It's set up for purposefully set up for drama. Yeah, my favorite's one, yeah, they're like, okay, in five minutes I'm going to teach you how to make these standard drinks, which I know bartenders should know, but it's like, I'm going to reteach you how to be a bartender, and then they get pissed at them. Well, you assume that they spend the afternoon doing it. Like, yeah. It's edited down, obviously. No, I know, but, but it, it like, makes it seem like I'm going to... What I felt bad for was that bar that... That it was this bar that didn't have their liquor license. They only had their beer license, and they had to reteach all the bartenders like everything because you know before they just gave out beer. You know, like well they didn't know because they didn't yeah know they know. Drinks. And I was like, that's a hard learning curve. Like it's hard to learn it in a day and then execute. Yeah, yeah, because like, you and do all, it. in a four day span because yeah. that's all he spends. I mean, what they do is they pare things down so it's like okay, there's only gonna be four drinks. Same thing like Gordon Ramsay will do like a simplified menu, like stuff like that. But it works. That tries to work within the capabilities of the staff. But it still matches the theme. But yeah. And sometimes, and there's, you know, some people can handle it, some people can't, obviously. But I don't know. Like, I, there is, like, a certain element of, like, sleazy TV unfairness that is just setting it up so that they, it'll be hard on purpose. And the Bar Rescue is even worse because there's, like, 36 hours of renovations in Bar Rescue. So, like, during that, and he's only there for, like, five days. It's like 36 hours of that time, nobody's there, like, doing anything. Yeah, exactly. So it's even it's even less. At least Gordon Ramsay doesn't leave. Yeah. So we think. So we think. Yeah. They say they do all the renovations overnight. Which is probably a little easier to do, like, a restaurant overnight. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, it's okay. Like, I enjoy it just on an entertainment level. Like, yeah, I, more what Taffer's gonna do next. Yeah, kind of just to see how John Taffer reacts to things. That's really kind of what makes me watch it. Like, oh no, man, me too. John Taffer's gonna have gonna have quite the time with this place. I like the little clips that get you excited for what's coming up next because they always just show him freaking out, and you're like, oh my god, what made him do that? And it's usually something really small. Oh yeah, yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, because he gets he's like, it's it's like a bad mafia movie, isn't that what you said? Yeah, they, you know, because it just looks like yeah, because they like scope out the restaurants or, or I the keep bars. saying restaurants, the bars beforehand. And they send in their spies and they sit in like an SUV outside and, like, with watch, like dim lights. Watch like this the <laughs> hidden cameras, and it looks like like a yeah, it looks like a scene out of a mafia movie. It's just kind of funny. Yeah, I I don't know. It's pretty pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I like, recommend it for a couple. If episodes. I never watch it again, I wouldn't. I wouldn't care. It wouldn't bother me. But if there are more episodes, bring but if there if there are more, I'd watch them. Yeah, if I have access to them, if I remember. If not, like no great tragedy. Yeah. I would be bummed. Like, uh, but, but I'd be bummed if I missed some kitchen nightmares. Which we found out we missed a couple episodes. I'm hungry for more episodes of kitchen nightmares. I I don't think he does that that much anymore. I don't know if he does. I know he does Master Chef now. 
and Hell's Kitchen. It's a travesty. Yeah. Master Chef. Master Chef Junior was way better than the adult version. Oh no, I like Master Chef. It's just a, it's a travesty that he's not doing any more Kitchen Nightmares. It takes away attention from my favorite one. No, I know. Okay, yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's that's Bar Rescue. Yeah. Watch it if you're really bored and you have what? Spike TV, and if that doesn't like immediately gross you out. Yeah. It is a very Spike TV produced television show. Even John Taffer, like, overly masculine, aggressive, like, shit, is, it just seems, it's perfect for Spike TV. Yeah, and all the mixologists that are on the show and all the bartenders they hire are, like, really hot girls. Did you ever notice that? Yeah, of course they are. Never hire, like, guy bartenders? The hell? No, not really. Whatever, man. I'll stick to my lifetime, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, female bartenders probably bring more revenue, even if it's with girls. Oh, even yeah. with other women. Eh, it depends. Less threatening. Sometimes. Sometimes some of those bartender girls are really gruff. Well, I mean in a really broad sense. Not in a realistic sense of, like, you know, one-on-one, person-to-person. Because, you know, I've been to plenty of bars where, like, I've dealt with some, like, real bitch, like, bartenders. I'm like, you're just, oh. Yeah. It's real, like, snooty, stuck-up bartenders. You're like, ah, oh, fuck you. But anyways. <laughs> um, I, I, I digress. <laughs> I never really... I just don't give a shit about bartenders, really. I've been a bartender, so, like, I don't... It's not something I look fondly back on. I feel bad for bartenders. Yeah, no, it's a shit job. No, but, like, if you're in the right place, though, you make you make a lot of money, so... I guess that's what keeps them there, I suppose. And some people do love it. Yeah. They love it, because it's, like, this constant connection to, like, nightlife. I, I, don't, I like when I serve at... I work at an old folks' place, a retirement community. I like when I'm the bartender for them. It's fun. Cause them letting their letting their curls down, you yeah. know. Yeah, that's a controlled environment, though. Sometimes you should see the one New York lady. It's not out in that the wild. That told me like... openly she used to be a booze hound for rye, and she demands her wine. She points at her glass and stares at me like I have to come over and fill it for her right away. There you go. And I'm like, you will wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's uh, that's really all we watch for TV. Yeah, it yeah, is. We didn't. Really watch it. No, because that streaming has taken a lot of our watch time. Definitely took some a couple nights away from actually watching other things. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, but we did watch movies on our free time. We watched a lot of movies lately, actually, more which, than we have in a while. Which I love. Yeah, so it was cool. So we kind of went out and saw like most of the newer movies that have come out and stuff. Um, before we so kind of like all the prestige pictures that are going to be in contention for the Academy Awards, basically. Yep. Um, but it just so happened we wanted to watch them anyways, so it worked out. Perfect. Uh, but we're gonna pare it down and not talk about everything we watched. We'll just talk about like two. Yeah. Two of the more ones that are like conversation worthy, I guess, because not everything is conversation worthy. It's true. It's a true story. Uh, what do you want to talk about first? Let's talk about her first. Oh, yeah, her. Mm. Spike Jones film. Actually, I wrote half of a review for it today and then did not finish it. But I will, I'll will. i finish it tomorrow before I put this up. So that'll be there for you. The way I describe it in my review... Yeah, let me hear this. Well, my title is Her is super convinced of its own importance. But my original title was going to be a movie by narcissists about narcissists for narcissists. <laughs> True. It's a tongue twister. Or White People Problems, the movie. In the future. <laughs> future White People so Problems. So it's basically like a somewhat vague time in the future, like which is cool. Uh, there's like an interesting kind of backdrop. Yeah, you don't really know how far in advance we're thinking. Yeah, so it's, it feels like a decade from now, or a couple of years from now. Like, And the guy, it's about a man who falls in love with an operating system that's like highly... Aware, it's like the nice version of Skynet in a lot of ways, um, <laughs> and also at some point you realize this is just a subtle remake of the film Simone, starring Al Pacino. Which is something you said while we were watching it. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's it's not similar enough, but I still like that joke. Anyways, <laughs> uh, what did you think of her? Where? Because well, let's well first of all, both of us really like Spike Jones. Yes. I've and lo- I really like Joaquin Phoenix. I liked all of his movies. 
This is the first movie that he has both written and directed. Every other movie is a... Direction. Just director. Somebody else's script. Yeah. And I have some theories about why... I, I don't really like this movie, her. But I have some theories why this... Didn't work out? Didn't work for me. And the other ones did. But I don't know. Um, it's a really a... I think it's an interesting idea, especially with, especially how connected people are to technology, I guess. Yeah, it's a, it's got some g- good subtext. There's some stuff in there that is, like, interesting. Yeah, but for a majority of it, I was bored. And then I was just kind of like, yeah, white people problems. <laughs> well, like, I wasn't... I don't know. I guess I, I hesitate to say I was ever bored watching it. I just wasn't interested. That's what I mean. I don't think they... It's it's hard to empathize with the character the characters in this film. Mm-hmm. Because like we said, and I know we were making a joke in very broad terms, but the white people problems. It is it is the the existence of like first privi- world first, first world, world very, affordances. Very first world stuff. And like a part of it is uh, like I'm, I'm trying to find the right word. It's like a movie that's made for like very liberal leaning like single middle-aged white people. And like, and and if you think about in like broad terms about how people, some people in society are, I guess, um, being a little bit narcissistic, a little bit kind of self-absorbed. Yeah. All the characters are very self-absorbed, and they're even the operating system does become very self-absorbed at one point. Yes, at a certain point, it starts caring only about kind of her needs and wants. Um, And that's hard for me to relate to, I guess. Like, people that are that, like... Into themselves. Yeah. And not in a way that's, like, aggressively... Offensive. Mm Mm-hmm. But it's... It's just, like, posits this idea that, like, this is just how people are. And I just don't buy it. I mean, some of it is on on a certain respect. You have to, like... Okay, it's telling a story that has a very specific, like, message. So a lot of it's going to be heightened, a lot of it's going to be exaggerated, I guess. There's to to l- drive the point home. Drive the point home. There's a lot of, like, on-the-nose dialogue, a lot of, like, reflexive thinking, a lot of, like, ponderous moments where people talk about the nature of love and relationships. And, um, and at, you know, and at the end of the day, like, even though I didn't like this movie, like, I agree with its general message about uh, its, like, notion of how it's, like, talking about love. Mm. About love being a thing of, like the mind more that it's like more of a mental thing than anything it's like else a, it's more of like an existential idea that like the way that feelings are yeah. you know what i mean then it is like a physical thing all the time like that's what's most important is like the connection you make like, yeah but i don't know it's just but i don't think the movie does a very good job of doing that no cuz even with the moment i think the moment that it really was trying to make that point was when Chris Pratt's character was with his girlfriend and Joaquin Phoenix admits that he, you know, is in love with an operating system or whatever. And he's like, oh, cool, man, bring her along. And the couple's accepting of it. I think that's when it's kind of, in a way, trying to say most that, like, oh, whatever, whoever you love, you know, it's more of a mental thing and, like, you know, I don't know. Well, see, and that's actually part of the part of the problem I had with this movie. There's no conflict. There's no yeah. drama. In the, for the, the majority of this movie, there's no drama. There's only drama when... Not actually, when? Well, towards the end of the film, like when things oh, start... To go awry. Samantha starts becoming so self-aware that, like, she... But, like, she understands that she's different, she's not human, and there's kind of this pull away... Yeah. ...from uh, the dependency thing. Um, becoming her own being. In a, in a certain respect, which I hope is not a spoiler. It's I, I would imagine that's gonna be pretty obvious if you're you got like a couple thoughts in your head. <laughs> I mean, like I'm serious. I called like what would be the conclusion of this film a half hour into the movie. Yeah, you did. Like almost exactly, almost. I was a little off. Oh, I was I, off on I, the specifics, but in a broad sense, I was dead on like what this movie was gonna do. I I felt kind of the same way. Well, you kind of were in, like, a traditional mindset of, like, a traditional romance story. Was I? Yeah. Amy Adams is also in this movie, and she plays, oh, like, her... Yeah. She plays, like, Joaquin Phoenix, like, good friend. They've known each other since college, and she has recently... At some point in the film, she breaks up with her uh, her boyfriend that she's been together with for, like, eight years. 
And so now she's, like, free and stuff like that. And, uh, Sarah... Oh, yeah, You had the notion that you thought they were going to get together. Yeah. Like, oh, look how they obviously care a lot about each other and stuff. And I was like, no, there's no way. There's no way in hell. And it's not going to be a negative thing. It's because they were never meant to be romantically entangled at all. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sean wins. (laughs) Well, just, I mean, if you think in context of the type of filmmaker Spike Jones Mm -hmm. is, and then also what the movie had presented to you so far about people. You know, how it... That, and then also, they had even said outright, like, we were, we just weren't, he said that, like, we just weren't, like, meant, you know. Yeah, it just wasn't meant to be, and that's fine. And it's, but it's more of, like, this, I guess, I hate really talking in these terms, but, like, the progressive notion of, like, oh, yeah, yeah, relationship doesn't work out, you're still, like, best buddies. Yeah. Like, this kind of romantic idea of, like, relationships and That's people. not real in real life. It's not real. It's not. And they do have the flip side of that, like, where he has his ex-wife or his soon-to-be ex-wife that he's kind of holding off on the divorce papers. And he still, like, insists that they're friends, but they could tell there's a lot of animosity there. And tension, yeah. Um, but I don't know. I think the movie's got its its head way up its own ass. And it's like, I didn't like Joaquin Phoenix's character. No, I didn't at all. I mean, he did a good job, but... I don't He didn't annoy me or anything, but there was just, like, nothing that I... Really connected with? Yeah, it's nothing I connected with. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with because it's... I and mean, you hate to say it again, but it's like white people, first world, like, problems to the max. Like, this is obviously... And this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier about why I think this movie fails where his other movies have worked really well. Is that this is all Spike Jones? He's the, the arbiter of this creation. Right. Right? So, And this is a, apparently a very personal story. It's about him and Sofia Coppola, and then him and, like, uh, Michelle Williams, and him and Miranda July. Yeah. Miranda July is Amy Adams, Sofia Coppola is Rooney Mara, and um, Michelle Williams is Samantha. Yeah. Wow. I didn't think of it so, that way. Yeah. And it's. <clears throat> and the, what Spike Jones is really good at, and, like, in his other movies, they're all kind of heightened, like, slightly fantastical films. Yes. In a lot of ways, right? But what he's, he's a very, you can tell he's a very sensitive, empathetic person. So he can, he was able to find, like, the human touches in those stories that really grounded them and made them work where it might have, the, those storylines could really be alienating if he didn't have that, like, touch as a director. And in this movie, it's just too much of it. Mm. It's too much emphasis on, like, the sensitivity and, like... So any any other emotion or ability to look at anything otherwise lacks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a failing of the movie. And I think the movie fails on, like, giving you anything interesting in any of the other characters and how he interacts with any of the other characters. It doesn't, it's like, doesn't matter almost, in a weird way. Do you know what the movie does not fail at? What? Fantastic high-waisted pants. That's right. In the future, people wear high-waisted pants and button-up multicolored shirts. That's it. That is the future, ladies and gentlemen. Ugh. Um, but, but, like, I don't know. Like, when we were done watching the movie, I was really, like, I guess frustrated. Yeah, so you seemed a little agitated. I was, like, agitated with it. Like, and I really, like, it's not, like, it doesn't, like, personally offend me or anything like that, but I keep going back to, like, this idea of this, like, this totally unrelatable, like, lifestyle. Mm. And also that the movie, like, posits the idea that, like, well, people are shitty and we all ignore each other because of all this technology and stuff like that. Like, you'll see oftentimes, like, Joaquin Phoenix walking through a crowd of people and everybody's talking. Mm-hmm. But then nobody's talking and to, to each, each other. other. It's all to their devices. And it posits a future where we just accept that. Yeah. We just accept, like, this kind of narcissistic behavior. I hope not. Um, and whether it maybe that is a little truer to reality, the way things will will eventually uh, I hope go, not. it probably will be. I mean, it probably will be. But like, it just I don't know. It just maybe bothered me to be face to face with that in a way that wasn't like didn't jilt. It was you? like positive about it, not yeah. like. Oh, I don't think it really it? had an actual opinion on it. It just see, I, I do, it just was I, there. I, I do think it did because when you find out about like Joaquin Phoenix, like has this relationship, a romantic relationship with his operating system, Samantha, you find out, like, a little bit farther into the movie that this is kind of a phenomenon that's happening everywhere. And even Amy Adams' character is kind of subject to it. Yeah. 
and uh, people making these personal connections with these these machines or this, these systems, this program. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it, and it makes a good. It, it, it's this is interesting. I don't think the movie does a good a job of maybe presenting this. Yeah. But like, it's the idea that these, for a while before those programs begin learning a lot and progressing the, as themselves or turning into the other things or whatever, they are solely fixated on that person and they can feed their narcissism and give them everything that they want. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. It's all like this perfect relationship stuff. And then as they become more aware of themselves and have their own wants and needs and desires, like they outgrow the notion of like what humans like capacity for feeling and thinking this very becomes very antiquated to them very quickly. Yeah. Um, and that's why they go off in the the mothership, I guess you'd call it, into the ether or whatever. Yeah. Into the internet. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Into the internet. But so like that's the thing. Like there's so many things about this movie that like were interesting. I just find like the the core story to be really pretentious, like boring, almost like condescending. In, the, in a weird, weird way that, like, Dude, I don't... How do you find it condescending? Because I feel like it's almost like his borderline classist, like, point of view. Mm. Which is fair. It's fair. No, it's fair. Spike Jones is a fucking... Part of, like, the Brat Pack. Like, he's a privileged guy who came from a privileged background. He doesn't understand... He doesn't not gonna know what it's like to be an average Joe. He never has. Yeah. None of those people have. Like Sophia Coppola, I believe, is is very similar to Spike Jones. Oh yeah. Her, her perspective on the world, and it's not a perspective I can fault them. I can't because how can I say that about a person like that's how they were raised. That's, that's how, how their that's life all they was. Know. That's all they know. So it doesn't surprise me that like this is would be their their point of view. What bothers me more is like the. And because I, like, I'm into film criticism and stuff like that. I read a lot of blogs. I read a lot of writers and stuff like that. They just, and they all are kind of like that. Yeah. They're all kind of privileged in some weird way. And, like, and they're just, like, talk, talk this movie up like it was some kind of religious experience for them. And it's, like, the best movie Spike Jones has ever made. Really? And. Where the Wild Things Are. Where the Wild Things Are, maybe in hindsight, might be my favorite his most like poignant to me because because that's such a broad thing like childhood the way his examination of childhood and how you feel as a child was, yeah but that's what i mean, meant when i was saying earlier about these fantastical things he really finds those human touches yeah and he's really great at that and i think in her it's it's just it's too much and it's when it becomes the sole focus i think like you kind of lose the humanity, humanity of it you kind of do it kind of gets lost in there somehow because it gets lost in I use this, I've said this word a lot, but narcissism. It gets lost in that. Yeah. Like, there is no humanity, and narcissism is not fucking humanity. It's like a negative trait. Like, it's, Actually, it's super humanity, because you're super into a human. Yourself. So, boom. It is too bad, because I, I really wanted to like this movie. I was really excited to watch it. Yeah, I was too. I was really looking forward to it. Like, I like Spike Jones. Uh kind of was just excited he had a new movie and then Joaquin Phoenix was going to be the lead and I really like Joaquin Phoenix um, so I was I was, I didn't have like high end expectations for it or anything I was just excited about the idea of it yeah because I didn't really know anything about it other than it's basic conceit before I watched it no me either and you know and it's just I don't know really let me down I can tell like, I don't know, I feel like I've been rambling. I don't know if I've really made my point clear. No, you have. So I, don't, I don't hate the movie. It just, it didn't hit you the way it should have. It just doesn't even sit with me very well. It yeah. It kind of makes me upset. Yeah, I can see your eye twitching. <laughs> but it, the thing that makes me more upset about it is the kind of the critical just acceptance. It's, they, it's almost like they didn't look any deeper into that movie other than just like the the notion of like being in adult relationships. They surface right a surface movie. Yeah, I guess. I mean, there's more stuff in there. It's just not done, paid very much service. No, that's what I mean. It's a pretty surface movie, so they surface right a, they're feeding into the same kind of... And everybody puts themselves into the shoes of the character, Walking Phoenix. It I seems didn't. Like everybody... I put myself in Samantha's shoes. It's like, what is it like to be... A banana. A banana, yeah. No, but like, uh, because he is so like an empty vessel. Yeah. He is, a lot of ways. He's very... Not a lot of character there. He doesn't say much. He doesn't Except say much. He doesn't express much. And I know part of that is the point. 
is that he does not good. He's not a good communicator, even though what he does for a living, which is so fucking just bullshit, romantic irony shit. He, <laughs> he writes personal letters for people as a job. That's what he does. So like somebody, I want to write Sarah a love letter. I could hire this company, and Joaquin Phoenix might write that letter for <gasps> me and send it to you. Can you have Joaquin Phoenix write me a love letter? No. Because okay. that'd be weird. So, but that's what he does for a living, and he writes the most beautiful letters. He's the most articulate, like, it gets passionate. gets put in a published book. Gets, Samantha gets it published for him, and it's so, like, oh, now I think about that part, and that's a whole other can of worms. That's a whole other aspect <laughs> of the movie that's just unsettling. Um, but yeah, and I, it's very, it's, it, it definitely does feel, especially when I found out that it was, like, a very personal, it does feel very autobiographical to, like, a director. Yeah, you know, I didn't think of it that way till you just said that. Now the more I sit with it, I agree. Like, that's, I never thought about his relationships and well, like, it being personal. Yeah. Yeah, and it does, and it makes, it makes sense. It, to me, it didn't make the movie any better, but it made sense. Like, I got it. Like, you know? Just in the very vague things I've heard about his girlfriends in the past, and um, like, but he's part of that. This, this, this really—I don't know how to call it. Like, I get the Brat Pack. Yeah. Directors of like Sofia Coppola, um, Wes Anderson. Listen, I uh, like Wes, Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson's way better. Yeah. Even though I think he's cold and detached, but I at least it, that works for me way better. And he's coming from exactly the same fucking place. Which is another movie I'm excited to see, his new movie. Yeah, Budapest Grand Bud- Bud- Budapest Hotel. Looks mm-hmm. good. Looks good. Um, but he's coming from exactly the same place. Yeah. And his story is he's always written his own movies. He's always the writer. Oh, him and Roman Coppola. Yeah. Um, and what's his name? Jason Schwartzman. No. I'm just thinking of that group. Who? What's his name? Look into my eyes. Wedding Crashers. He was a model Owen Wilson. Rocket. Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson also writes. With I didn't a lot. get the look in the. He's, he's look. No, I didn't, no. I was just reading my mind. Oh. <laughs> no, Owen Wilson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess there's a little bit more collaboration there, but his stories have always kind of come off that way to me. Is they're a little cold and they're uh, often are about stuff like a movie that I my least favorite Wes Anderson movie is probably the one that most people like the most. Rushmore. No, it's uh, Royal Tenenbaums. Yeah. No, that's my least favorite. We still have to rewatch that. Yeah, I do. I would like to revisit it. I'd like to rewatch it. But it, it, for a long time, that has been my least favorite one. And then my favorite one was... Life Aquatic. Well, Life Aquatic, because it's the most different, impersonal, in a way. The personal part is his relationship with his father, which he talks about in every well, and movie. Well, and the relationship with that shark. Yeah. The great shark, that that unattainable thing. Mine's still about. But like uh, Miranda July, do you know who Miranda July is? No. You ever see You, Me, and Everyone We Know? Yes. That's Miranda July. Oh really? She plays. She's the main actress. Yeah. She's also the writer director. I didn't like um, that movie. Neither do I. But that's kind of very similar to her. And Miranda July actually came out with a movie within the past year and a half or two years called The Future. <gasps> oh. I always joked that that was going to be Blue Valentine 2.0 for me. It was going to just be ridiculous and funny. Uh, it is... I didn't... I couldn't sit through the whole movie. Was it the one with the cat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we were going to go see it in the theater, me and some friends, but we didn't. It's like about this 40-year-old couple that are artists or whatever. Yeah. And, like... Trust fun kids. And they don't... Like, yeah. Like, she wants to be an interpretive dancer... I don't know. But it's, just, ah. but it's this whole thing that's so far up his own ass where, like, they just don't care about anybody but themselves. It's so very clear that this is just about them. Yeah. And not anybody else around them. Like, so it's just like this... It's a it's a perspective and a point of view that I do not like in people. So why would I... I don't like it when I see it see in it. a movie. Well, that's why I'm not a big Co- Sofia Coppola fan. Yeah, it, you know, the only Sofia Coppola movie I enjoy... Uh oh. I don't know if I can say I like it. But I do enjoy it. Is mm. um Lost in Translation. Mm. A lot of that has to do with Bill Murray. Bill Murray it's a Bill Murray one man show. I still have to make it through that. Just because for me, like I can just watch Bill Murray do it. I could watch him read a book or like paint. No, I know, but I every time I've put that movie on I've made it twenty minutes in and I fall asleep. Every yeah, time. It's really 
really slow, almost like dreamy, kind of like. Yeah, so that's one I have to try and stay up for. Just no, just to see it, because a lot of people tell me I'd like it if I made it through. But it's it's fairly pointless. It is. It's about a guy. I heard Bill the Murray, car- I heard a karaoke scenes in it. It's very. It's good. It's great, actually. That's yeah. a great scene. Uh, and they, and that's actually I would say that like uh, like Sofia Coppola, Miranda July, maybe not so much Miranda July, but Spike Jones. Even in her, there are moments where the movie really works, and you really do are feel like touched in a way, and like. But like overall, her the just the cons outweigh the pros in this case. At least yeah. for me. No, I agree. That's my personal perspective. I'm sure people will call me an asshole or whatever, or like I don't know what I'm talking. Well, you're about. a pretentious asshole. I am kind of. I am. A maybe bit. maybe we should. Maybe that's why I didn't like it because I saw myself <laughs> reflected back at me. You're like ah ah. Ah man, grow a mustache, buy a pink shirt. Oh my God, don't wear high waisted pants though, please. At least not until you're like seventy. Yeah, I, no, I just wish something happened to that movie. Like, I wish there was some like conflict that would happen. That would like, why is everybody like just the greatest people on earth and accepting of like the operating system? Like, why can't I would have been like, what the? Why fuck? couldn't there be like a, a like some moments where people were like, what? That's like, weird. at least yeah. confused by it. Yeah. To give him some sort of reason to justify the relationship. No, Everybody's I agree. Just so like accepting of it or Except, like or enamored by it like Amy Adams is kind yeah, of enamored by oh it she's like God. really Make me sick. really what's it like do you have sex like, yeah. what's it like <laughs> that was actually it made me laugh when I found out she was based on Miranda July because I was like that is fucking Miranda July would show her friends like a video of her mom sleeping yeah and be just like stare at it and like and that'd be it be like what <laughs> but anyways um, you know, and this is coming from like I am secretly, or not really secretly, but like I don't, I don't think I come off as very artsy fartsy, but I am kind of artsy fartsy. No, you are. But I don't think I really come off that way. No. I probably come off like a little too spiked TV. <laughs> <laughs> Out of his mouth, not mine. I fart and drink beer and have a beard right now. So, this is a beard by request. Yeah, I like it. Um, but yeah, so that was uh, that's her. That's Spike Jones's. The latest movie. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I, if you're listening to this and you have any interest, in, like I, I'm going to explore some of this stuff more cohesively in my review. Are you, say, are you saying we're not cohesive? No. Like, I'm I, have, I'm I can sit there and think about it before I write it down, at least. Yeah. Um, because it's like... I'll say this. I'll say this about this movie in, a, in the positive. It makes me think about things. Maybe it's a good movie then. Not anything that the movie's about, <laughs> but just the things surrounding the movie and like, and uh, I don't know why it just doesn't work for me. I just I don't understand why people love this movie. Like why it's being so no. Fun I over. would say watch it if you're bored, but I don't. It's not something I'm like rushed to. Like I don't understand the love for it either. Like it, I, I watched it. That's how I feel about it. Like I watched that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Oh, and we watched something else too. What? The Harb, the Harbor, the Harbor, <laughs> the Harbor part goes. <laughs> Hobbit, the desolation of smog. Smog, yes, I have to say it. Smog. 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 What do you think of the Hobbit? I enjoyed it. It was like parts of it were kind of dragged out too much for me, which I feel like they're doing. We've talked about this. They're doing with this whole story. It's kind of being drug out too much. It's being really artificially like lengthened. Yeah, and, um, but, like, I think I agree with you that I liked it better than the first Hobbit. Yeah, I was, I was more entertained. I think it was more entertaining. It's, like, just broken up into, like, action segments. Action. And then... Adventure. Ends. Yeah, and then, yeah. But I'm curious to see what's going on in the third one now, though. Like, what? I don't know how they're gonna fill another three hours. I'm really curious. <laughs> Yeah, no. I see it out of that curiosity of like, how are you gonna fill? Maybe hours? it's like they kill Smog, and then it's like two hours of just dwarves singing. <laughs> Maybe probably. Dude, I would love that. Oh my god. I would love oh that. Oh my god. So like, I, we talked about this a little bit uh, earlier episode that like I kind of turned pretty hard on the Hobbit. Yeah, the you second did. Second time I saw it. Yeah, you did. To almost to the point of like not liking it at all. Yeah. Um. 
I still like it. There's just things about it that I really love, that I really like. I really like the casting. I really like some of the adventure stuff. Like, I really love moments. But as a whole, like, it's such a fucking slog, and the desolation of smog was no different. Like, it is just, like, filled with so much extraneous shit, and you're just like, why? Why? Like, who is who are they making this for? No, I, I heard you saying that. You were talking to your cousin earlier, and I heard you say that, and I was thinking about that, and I was like... Because the first Hobbit, when you asked, like, who are they making this for, it had more of a children's kind of tone to it, because it is kind of like a young reader kind of book. It is. It's for kids. Yeah, it's for kids. It's for like 10-year-olds. Yeah. So I think the tone of the first Hobbit met that, but then, like, this was just kind of like... This one leaned really hard into connecting it to Lord of the Rings. Yes. Very hard. And, like, and, and it's a much, quote-unquote, darker film. Like, it's the dark middle chapter, right? Yeah. Like, the classic trilogy structure. And it just fucking... And it would be nice, because there's things about it that are interesting and that are exciting, and but there is so much extra shit. Like, this is, like... I understand from a business standpoint why Legolas is in this movie. But, but the, at the same time, why is Legolas in this movie? Why is Legolas in this movie? And then not only did you put Legolas, you created another character. So girls could have somebody to look up to or something. Not even that. I think the she female, was more the there. The female elf. Yeah, and then, but I think they had a romantic element. And it was like... What? A really half-assed love triangle that's it, not really there. But is. But is. Yeah. And it's just like... Well, isn't that how most love triangles are? That's true. <laughs> no, but it's just like... No, this movie's like devoid of like things happening. It's just like a couple set pieces. And then... like, And it's all supposed to be leading up to like them going into the... Like the... I don't know what you call it. Like the cave. Mm -hmm. The kingdom. The castle in the, that's built into the mountain. And... It takes almost two hours to get there. And nothing happens in those almost in those two hours. Almost nothing happens of con oh. of consequence. Yeah. There's one thing that needs to happen. Is they have to meet the guy, the barge guy. They have to meet this dude who's on a boat who has can get them into Laketon because in the story spoilers in the story of the Hobbit he shoots smog with <gasps> his black arrow. Sean, I don't want to see part three now. <laughs> No, because he's like no, he and, and they mention it kind of. They briefly go over it in the movie. Like his family is kind of dis, in dishonor or whatever you want to call it because uh, his f grandfather couldn't kill Smog and save Dale, mm. the town, not the man. Yeah, <laughs> I like when your brother was bringing it up, Dale. <laughs> so like, um, so he has like this thing to like live up to, and I'm he's gonna kill Smog because he's like the greatest, one of the greatest archers ever. And they kind of show you that in the beginning when you first meet him. Yeah. He's, like, knocking rocks out of the dwarves' hands with his bow and arrow. Um, so that's really the only thing that needed to happen. But a whole bunch of other stuff happens. Yeah. Yeah. Barrel battles. Barrel battles, spiders. Which spider part was cool. I liked that part. Although they really changed it. And just yeah. to introduce so Legolas could jump in and save everybody and... They could get to the elves. Look at my icy blue eyes. So they could get to the elves. Yeah. And then the stuff with the elves just it doesn't need to be there. Like th when they added like Legolas and this other new um, woman elf, they have to sit there with in the elf place for like another fifteen minutes because they have to give them something to do. Mm -hmm. Like, they can't just be there in the movies. They have to have something to do, so they have to, like, build up some type of character <laughs> plot. Or not even on a plot, but just have to give them some type of character, some type of identity. So you have to waste, like, 15, 20 minutes of them talking to each other about nothing of consequence. Right. And it's... It's, like, so apparent that I get distracted by it. Like, mm. it's so, like, artificial in a weird way. Like, just to drag this out. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Did you get that feeling when you were watching it, or did you not notice that? No, I felt like it was just dragging on. I mean, I was still, like, dragging. Get it? <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Yeah, the elves were really distracting. I didn't mind some of the other, like, Lakeland stuff that was added in. 
Yeah. Like, the more... Because you gotta, like, I guess, get more connected to that for when the battle happens, you know what I mean? That's gonna inevitably come up in the next movie. Yeah. But, yeah, the I just... Whenever Lee Pace talked, I was like, shut up, asshole. Which is sad, because I like Lee Pace. He was in Pushing Daisies. Mm-hmm. I love that show. But... <laughs> No, I just, I, I did feel like it was taking too long, because I think I asked you a couple times, like, how much longer does this have? Yeah. But, I don't know. It did hold my attention a lot better, though, with all the action, so I don't know. I can't really, I don't know what to think of it. Yeah, I don't mean, like, I was, it held my attention, but I was, like, frustrated the whole time I was watching it. The only time I got lost in the movie was when they got to Smog. No, oh, yeah, Smog was great. And then I finally was into it. Like, I was Thanks, like, Cumberbatch. I was like, wow, this is... No, because it's, it's kind of like the same way in like the first Hobbit, where like the riddles in the dark was the most compelling part of the movie. Yeah. Because like, that's the big moment for that part of the book. This is kind of the big moment for the end of the Hobbit. Of the book. Not yeah. the movies, apparently. Yeah, no. Uh, but, like, so... And it worked really well, and they did a really good job with it. Um... And it's just, but it took way. There's too much just bullshit to get there. To get to because not only the it like, doesn't make you feel like in the like in the Lord of the Rings movies, it, it makes you feel like you're going on a journey with them. This just made you feel like I don't know. Yeah, you didn't get the sense of like the distance Adventure. or you know, them traveling very much or anything. And I think you did a lot more in the first one. There's yeah, a lot more of them like walking through fields and shit. Yeah, this one is just like stumbling and from one place to the next, and you know like the barrels and. Yeah. And just, like, the CGI mess, like, half the movie. That is annoying. It is. It's distracting. And it's distracting even more so because we have a trilogy of films that Peter Jackson made in, to compare it with that did it correctly. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, when you see it, like, just the just over-reliance on post-production CGI stuff, you're like, what the fuck? It is really distracting, and it uh, doesn't feel like... There were a couple of the fight sequences with the CGI... And I was just like, it, I mean, there it didn't fit well. There are entire scenes with works talking to each other that is completely 100% animated. No, I know. But I'm just saying, for me, it was like... Actually, during the barrel battle, there were a couple times when they were turning, the CGI was so apparent. Oh, yeah. That it was like, I took away from it, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. No, it just kind of looks... Cheesy. Cheesy, yeah. Which is... That I had less of a problem with. I have more of a problem with just like how it's everywhere. Like, because if you're going to do, like, a crazy, silly action scene, or, like, set piece, like, it's going to have some CGI on it. Like, I just accept that. Yeah. But, like, it had a lot of stuff that I didn't, I don't know. Care about, or, no, not even that. It's just more, for me, it's just more of a problem of just, like, other than the CGI mess stuff, it's just, like, how much just stuff they add to the movie for no reason. It doesn't, like, make the movie better. And they really are trying really hard, and I'm sure this has a lot of studio in, uh, involvement in this, is like, this has to be very clear, this is a prequel to Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Even though it's fucking completely obvious. That what it, Because what it's it fucking is. about hobbits, and dwarves, and they're in Middle Earth. Like, that should be enough. Right. You do not have to point to me, like, ah, oh, this is how Sauron came back. Like, even it, that stuff, I don't need it. Like, why do you, you don't even, you don't need it. I understand, but I also It'd understand less... it's... Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I understand it's like Peter Jackson being like, you know, um, trying to include everything, but at the same time it's not necessary. Like, because, like, the appendices are now added in to the movie. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I know, I'm agreeing with you. doesn't need to be there. No. But he's doing the appendices and more. Like, if it was just the appendices stuff, if, like, the other subplot... If the other plot, like the subplot, was just the Gandalf stuff, that'd be fine. Yeah. But no, we have like now we have the Elf subplot, and now we have like this corrupt politician and Layton subplot. It's and, true. You know, and then we have the Legolas subplot, and we have the uh, the attractive dwarf, sick attractive dwarf, and the female Elf subplot. Yeah. Like this movie's fucking all over the place. When it's really just a simple story. It really is. It's just like it boggles my goddamn mind. Boggles my mind. And then, he, and then when they have Legolas there, he has to have like this throwdown fight with the new major orc guy, yeah. who is actually the one that is actually in the Hobbit. Yeah. 
Not the other one. No, Azog's brother. I think Azog is the white, like the one from white the first dwarf. one. Yeah. Not dwarf. Orc. Orc. Oh my god. God, Sarah. <sighs> no, but like, yeah, so, and this is his brother, he, that's, because Azog actually dies in the battle. Yeah. That sets up the movie, or sets up the story, rather, and his brother is the one that's looking for retribution at some point, but he's not, like, a main part. It's, like, a side thing. Yeah. So it's just, like, I don't know. Like, God damn it, man. Like, imagine if Peter Jackson had made The Lord of the Rings under this type of, like, with this type of mentality. People, man, people would have hated it. It would have been so stuffed with bullshit. No, I agree. Good thing we got those first. But, like, the thing about The Lord of the Rings, he had to make, like, a lot of really hard decisions as far as, like, storytelling decisions to cut shit out. That he knew would upset people, but it wasn't, like, like Tom Bombadil. This dude who lives in the forest. Yeah. It's a really, one of the most popular characters, like, side characters of the story. It's like this little episodic thing that happens, mm-hmm. separated from everything else, but people love it. And he had to cut it out. He had to cut it out of the script, because he understood, like, well, like, it's not really necessary. This, he's just like, well, it doesn't really matter, we're gonna put it in there, and then we're gonna add this too. And then maybe a little bit of this. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. I just feel the gross commercialism all over it. It bums me out. <laughs> bums me out. Oh, of course, you know New Line and Warner Brothers are like, well, this has got to be a fucking trilogy. Yeah, no. Because it's sure. supposed to be two movies. Yeah, I remember that when they first announced it, it was supposed to be two movies, and I think you were the one that was like, oh, it's three. And I was like, no, no. And you are like, yeah, they're making it three. And I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> that actually deflated my interest in the movies at all. Yeah. So I was like, three? Why? You don't need three movies to do The Hobbit. And then when I saw the first one, I realized how long it was. I was like, they're going to do this every single time. Every oh, movie is going to be almost three hours. Oh, of course. Oh, it's just it's just frustrating. It's frustrating as a fan of The Hobbit, like, in general. It's frustrating as just, like, a, a movie watcher. It's just frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> Major disappointment. I still enjoyed it. Like, I do and I don't. Like, I'd rather watch Smog than The Unexpected Journey, though. No, me too. Mostly just to get to Smog. Yeah, because that scene is so good. That sequence is great. It's fantastic. I like when they cover them in gold. Like, it's... It is... If they had lost... If that movie had been two hours, it Uh-oh. probably would have been really good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't need to be two hours and 45 minutes. Like, Do we really need to see dwarves coming out of a toilet? Oh, yeah. It's the best part. You will not speak a word of this to anyone. And that's another thing that's a detriment to the movie. All this extra stuff like takes away from the dwarves themselves. So only th- who's the guy, the people whose journey it is. Yeah, the only person that's ever characterized in any significant way is Thorin. Thorin, Thorin and his like old. Well, Bomba's wise... bumbling him fat. Yeah, he's pretty sweet. He, you see him all the time. You don't know anything about him. But you see him a lot. You just know he's a little they merry use, and they fat. Just, yeah, they just use it for silly sight gags. Yeah, like him running faster than everybody when they're getting chased. Yeah. And him jumping in the barrel and, like, getting stuck, like... <laughs> hilarious, Peter Jackson. And they made the two pretty dwarves. Yeah, they have the two, like, humanoid-looking dwarf guys. Even Thorin's not, like... No. He's a pretty handsome dude. No, he is pretty handsome. He looks a lot more handsome in real life, I'll say, but... Um, I've never seen him in real life. Yeah, he's a pretty, pretty good-looking dude. Oh. Yeah, he is. Why don't you marry handsome. him? I would if I could. He doesn't answer my letters. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's kind of deflated all interest in like the third one at all. We're still going to see it. I will still see it. Because now I'm cur- I'm just curious, like, oh, what the fuck are they going to do to like make this another three-hour movie? Yep. Like, how are they going to do that? They're going to drag the smog shit out, and it's going to make it not like impactful. It's not going to, yeah. Like uh, like it was in this movie, the next time you're just going to be so sick of smog, you're going to be like, well, no, the shut th- up, Cumberbatch. The thing is, like, if this had been the last movie, and they had to do the last act in this movie, it would have been a really exciting finish like to them to defeat smog, because you got all this momentum built up. Yeah. And now it's just, the momentum's gone. Like, it's it's over. It's like, it's like blue balls. You know? Man, I know what that's like. It sucks, man. Am I yeah, right, brother? He's deaf, man. He's coming to Laketon. I'm deaf. Benedict Cumberbatch was really great. I thought he did some good voice work for Smog. And he did, like, facial capturing stuff, too. You can tell by those squinty eyes. Yeah. Yeah, you can, actually. 
Like, just like the first one, the cast is great. The cast is fantastic. Really love the actors that they got cast there. You know whose fall is a little flat for me, though? Yeah. This is Martin Freeman, The Hobbit. Yeah. He kind of almost... Eh, I don't know. You don't think he's a good Bill Bell? I think, like... I don't know if that's entirely his fault. Because, like we said, it's so stuffed with other shit, you don't even get to spend time with him in any significant way other than him just doing action. I think he was, like, the more, though, in this one you could tell he, like, the his relationship with the ring changed his whole stature and stuff if you watched him close enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I think he did fantastic with things like that. Yeah, yeah, he You is. are not the same hobbit <laughs> that came on this journey. Yeah, they, yeah. They I just... found my courage. Well, that's funny, because they use that line in the trailer to uh, for a laugh, but in the movie, it's like... Really serious. Really serious, yeah. Supposed to have some gravity, some weight behind it. Oh, ha, 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 ha. I don't know. I I enjoyed it. Like, I, enjoy, I, I will say I enjoyed it, but, like, I don't know if I like it. Eh. It will not be a movie I revisit, like, all the time. Although, like, I'm such a weirdo, though, like... Yeah, you will. This happens the same time with me with uh, Star Wars. Whenever I go to watch Star Wars, I end up watching the prequels, even though I don't really like them. Oh, Johnny. <laughs> we just get on a train, and I'm like, I gotta get all the way. Well, that's what I was just gonna ask you, is like, don't you think we're gonna marathon all the movies? Holy shit. And you know I'll buy the extended version. Yep. <laughs> just, <laughs> I'm such, like, a, just a sick masochist. I'm like, this movie's too long already. I'm gonna get the longer one. I will wait to get the longer one. <laughs> yeah, you will. God damn it. I know I'm gonna do it, too. Oh, I know. It breaks my heart a little bit. I'm just a slave to the way I am. <laughs> God damn it. Maybe, maybe hurry is about me. Uh-oh. White people problems. <laughs> yeah. White people problems. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I wanna have some, like, starving Ethiopian kid come up and kick me in the shin. Like, oh, really? You're going to buy the extended version. That's your big, that's the thing, that's your problem? <laughs> I ain't got no goddamn bread. And I'm like, that sucks, man. And then you just take a bite of the Subway sandwich. Yeah. I'm like, get out of here. Point made. See you later, kid. Just drop, like, a piece of it on the floor and step on it in front of him. <laughs> Whammy. My bad. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, Sarah. But you seem like you really love this movie. I don't love it. It seems like it's maybe your favorite. Yeah, of all time. What is your favorite movie of all time? You know the answer to that. Big Trouble in Little China. Duh. No, you know the answer to that. The Ro- Robin Hood? No. The Usual Suspects. Oh, The Usual. I forgot. I've answered this question before, too. Yeah. On this very podcast. Yeah. Um, oh lord, getting old. I think you should reassess your favorite movie. I think you should reassess everything in your life. Probably, that'd probably be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, this is getting too personal. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm Sarah. And you, thank you for listening. This is my future husband Facebook podcast episode twenty. Boom. We saw some stuff.